It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome into an episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That means that's Alan Saunders. Just a couple of guys here, Alan, with perfect brackets right now, sitting here talking about Steelers football. 4-0. 4-0. Not, not Chad. Uh, yeah, il- this Illinois-Moorhead State game uh, has been very good to start here. Moorhead State jumped out to an early lead. Uh, Illinois has fought back and currently leads by four. But, uh, yeah, maybe on the ropes a little bit with that one. But, um, yeah, I'm feeling good right now. I'm feeling good right now. That will change. I'm very confident that that will change. Um, yeah, I am also very confident that that will change. And you know what? Actually, I just got an idea that we should have 100% or I should have 100% done this. Maybe not you in your you know more professional setting. But one of the questions we, we, we took to uh, to X for some questions here. One of them was about you know Kenny Pickett and where he ranks in terms of draft bus. I should have made like a, a March Madness bracket of Steelers first round picks going up against each other for the biggest bust and see who came down and ended up being the number one. And maybe I still will do that now that that is in my mind. But anyway, uh, Alan, we got some things to talk about here. Obviously, if you guys are watching or listening to this afterwards, it will have been too late to get a question in for this episode, but please keep those coming for future episodes, as we always say. And let's just go to that one uh, right off the bat, because Peter says, is Kenny Pickett the worst draft pick in Steelers history? not named Devin Bush. So clearly this person also not a fan of Devin Bush. Also maybe some recency bias with the Kenny Pickett stuff, but Alan, where does Kenny Pickett rank in terms of Steelers first round picks? Yeah, I mean it's certainly not good, right? I mean Devin Bush I think you can make an argument that the Devin Bush pick was more damaging because of the trade up, right? I mean they gave sure. up so much more to move up to 10 to get him. I think that makes that pick more damaging um but i think he at least saw out the four years yeah yeah right i mean bush was at least like a four-year player for the team um if you want to go like all time in my mind the worst dealers draft bust at least in my lifetime is huey richardson back in 1991 made him the number first prick and 15th it's not like it was a a bottom of the end of the first round pick and he ends up playing just five games for the team That's probably the worst draft pick in like modern Steelers history. I don't know, like maybe back in the 40s or 50s or something like that, there were worse ones. But at least in terms of my recollection, that's that's the standard to which all draft busts will forever be held. It's really, really hard to be worse than only playing five games as the number 15 overall pick. Jermaine Stevens back in 19, I want to say 96. Um he was pretty poor pick as well, 29th overall, never got into shape, failed his, you know, test coming out of the, you know, training, tra- going into training camp uh, one year. He did end up starting about 10 games for the team, but d- didn't even nearly as make as much of an impact as Pickett did, I would say. I think those picks are pretty clearly worse. Certainly there are others like Bush where you're like, well, it was bad, but was it as bad? I don't know. Um, the Pittsburgh Steelers have a pretty strong draft history. And I think it's really interesting the way things ended with Kenny Pickett, right? Because every indication we have is that the Steelers wanted him to still be here. Their their intention mm-hmm. was to bring in competition for him this offseason and that win or lose, he was going to be a part of this team, not just this year, but potentially in the future. They bring in Russell Wilson on a one-year deal with nothing guaranteed to him. Uh, there was nothing stopping Kenny Pickett from winning that battle. It's not like Russell Wilson was all that great last year that that a player who was a first round pick shouldn't be able to look better than him this year, and certainly to put himself in position to do it again next year. Uh, and and the fact that he you know, left, asked to leave at that point, I think really makes this draft pick a whiff in hindsight because. I think the, the the selling point of Kenny Pickett was his character, was that he was going to work hard, was that he was going to be a good guy in the locker room. He seems to have lost the locker room. He seems to have not handled adversity with his teammates well. And I think that is the um, – when you're drafting a guy who has that low ceiling in general, like Kenny Pickett did not have, you know, all-pro quarterback ceiling, you, you can't miss on that stuff too, especially a guy who played right next to you at Pitt that you should have been very right, well yeah. – uh, acquainted with. Now, look, I've been covering P- Kenny Pickett longer than anyone, and you know, I didn't know how he was going to respond to the situation because he's never been in that kind of adversity. But 
I was surprised by it too. I'm not sitting here saying like the Steelers should have known what I knew. I, I didn't see this coming either, at least mm -hmm. you know at a time. But I think that's that's the pitfall of drafting a player like that. Where um, man, you know, you you like the, the thought process was with Kenny Pickett. Maybe he'll work out to be a starter or not. Maybe, maybe you know, even if he is a starter, he probably won't be a high level starter. But at the very worst, you should have a, a, a pretty decent guy to have around your team for a long while in terms of a guy who's maybe like a 1B type quarterback, where maybe if he's not even happy, if you're never happy with him as your starter, you're just happy to have him around. And that never materialized. And I think that's what makes this pick in hindsight so bad for the Steelers. I, yeah, I can't agree more. And for a lot of the reasons that you just said, like him being a guy from next door, the story was right there. Like it could have been a fairy tale and it turned into what it was, which was a nightmare for both parties and a very bad exit. So, uh, yeah, it's certainly one of the worst that I can recall. And again, you know, a little bit of an age gap between the two of us. But so there's some like Jermaine Stevens. I had to I had to Google uh, to to see who that even was. So to give you a little bit of insight there but um yeah uh moving on the next question that we got I here I like wanna, this. there's one okay. more thing i want to talk about yeah. here in, in regards to this and that it really is bringing into focus and and i guess maybe maybe into, into question like there was a lot of concern when the steelers let kevin colbert run the last draft sure. whether that was the right idea or not and mm -hmm. you know i think the way they did it it was really the only option uh, because, you know, when it was announced that he was going to be retiring, it was after the season, but before the draft, like you couldn't bring in a new general manager and get them up to speed on the off season that quickly. Like it wouldn't work. I just think it, 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 it questions that process, but it, it, in general really highlights uh, the draft did not go that well during the end of Kevin Colbert's tenure as Pittsburgh Steelers general manager. If we're looking at these last that, yeah. few first rounds here, Terrell Edmonds, decent player, never lived up to the billing of a first round pick. Devin trading up for Devin Bush, an abject disaster. The only one that looks like a win is trading the 2020 first round pick for Minka Fitzpatrick, something the Steelers mm -hmm. never ever did. And then, you know, Najee Harris, it's an okay pick. He's an okay player. It certainly hasn't worked out the way they thought. He's now splitting time with an undrafted free agent. And then Kenny Pickett, gone already after two seasons. If you want to know the number one reason why the Pittsburgh Steelers haven't won a playoff game in seven or eight years, it's those draft failures. Absolutely. Yeah, the last time that there was like a hit hit was TJ Watt. <laughs> In 2017, because like you said, uh, if you obviously can include Minka Fitzpatrick and not having a first round pick in 2020, that is what they got out of their first round pick. Sure. But actually selecting a player with their first round selection goes back to TJ Watt in 2017. Um, and it's not yeah, like that, they've been killing it down. Like, you know, you don't have to in the draft. You can make up for that if you're getting stars in later rounds. And certainly they've mm -hmm. done OK. Guys like Deontay Johnson, Alex Highsmith. Uh, you know, certainly look like they were drafted. Uh, uh, George Pickens certainly looked like they were drafted, you know, uh, later than they should have been, but not nearly enough to make up for the first round failures. I mean, already that entire 2020 class is gone, except for Alex Highsmith. Um, the entire 2019 class is now gone. The entire 2018 class is gone. The 2021 class already has. You've know, seen Kendrick Green, Buddy Johnson, they're gone. Um, and and look, I don't think that anybody thinks that Dan Moore is a part of this beyond this year either. So, I mean, it's right. it's that is the biggest reason for this team's struggle is that this is a team that has built itself through the draft, is going to continue to build itself through the draft, and that foundation over the last five years has fallen apart. And you can kind of bring that into, you know, the conversation we had yesterday where you need to hit on these draft picks and provide surplus on their contracts because you can't pay everybody, you know, a second contract. You got to find guys in the draft and be able to supplant your roster through doing so. And the Steelers, again, like you were saying, really since 2017, haven't done a great job of doing that. So there you go. Um, 
what remaining this comes from minka's goat and they're always sending questions so we appreciate this what remaining free agents do you want the steelers to target so yeah we're well past that first maybe even second wave of free agency at this point and then alan we've had conversations about center uh like brian allen right like he's basically their only option at this point if it's not brian allen you brought up nick gates into the conversation that could make sense too but i was like man at what point does bringing back mason cole just become the best option for them i mean i think it's certainly no worse than about the third best option like there's not that many other guys out there yeah so yeah i yeah. think i think you know that starts to be there are very few guys let's sort of actually just reset okay we, we've kind of talked over the last couple of days about the four big positions of need for the steelers right they need a center they need a tackle they need wide receivers uh, probably two of them <laughs> And they yeah. need a cornerback, especially one that can play in the slot. Let's just take a look, okay? Who are the free agents left at all those positions that you know could take some of the pressure off Omar Khan of having to go four for four with those four day one and two draft picks on those four spots and fill every single need, especially with you know it not being there's only three or four guys out there at center. There's only, you know, so many options that are upgrades over Dan Moore at tackle. It's really a narrow path if you try to do it all with the draft. So center, Brian Allen, I think of the Los Angeles Rams, a guy who's had injury history, but it's been good while he's played. Connor Williams mm -hmm. from Miami coming off a late season torn ACL, still not even healthy. He's probably yeah. a guy that will sign in June or July. If they want to wait that long, I guess that's an option. Uh, Nick Gates, there's very, I mean, Mason Cole is right there in terms of like who else uh, could you possibly sign that would be an option at center. But I do think there are some at these other positions, um, yeah. you know, tackle I'm a little skeptical of. There are like, tackle. it just doesn't seem to make sense uh, to. Well, yeah, the Ravens just got Josh Jones, and I thought that was maybe one that they could go with. There's some position I mean, like, flexibility there. Like, Andres Pete, uh, David Bakhtiari, mm. if he's healthy and ready to go, Makai Becton, Andre Dillard. Uh, there are tackles out there. Uh, Donovan I Smith, I Dillard. believe, is still, signed on, uh, still unsigned. Matt Filer, yep. former Steelers tackle. Like, they're out there. Um, I, I just yeah. don't know if that's something that they're going to want to do because I, I really think they would like to find a long-term solution at tackle. And they have mm -hmm. their short-term solution in Dan Moore. Like Dan Moore, no matter who they draft, Dan Moore is probably the week one starter, unless it's someone like Fuaga or Latham falls to them that are just like very experienced right tackles. Like Moore is probably the starter this year. They have their stop gap there, right? It's not like center where they just don't have anybody. So I don't know. Maybe if they you know get towards closer to the draft, they just decide, hey, look, it's corner or it's receiver. Let's go sign a tackle who's better than – Dan Moore, and let's do it right now. I could see it. Um, there are bodies out there. There are guys that I think are upgrades on the market left um, that the Steelers could sign. It just doesn't feel like that's the direction that Omar Khan is headed. Yeah. I mean, if Bakhtiari was healthy, but like that that's, hasn't been the case seemingly since 2021, uh, like when was the last time he even played 12, 10, 12 games? Like, I, I, I don't know, but I mean, certainly a, a great player at his position when he's healthy. Um, I was looking at receiver, though, because that's the interesting one to me, because there are still a lot of veteran names out there. Maybe not like a ton of splash. And most of these names that you're adding probably still need to pair with a relatively early draft pick as well. But, you know, Hunter Renfro's out there. You mentioned Odo Beckham Jr., who's meeting with the Dolphins today. We'll see if anything comes of that. Michael Gallup, Tyler Boyd, widely mentioned. Michael Thomas, uh, MVS, DJ Chark is out there. You know, Josh Reynolds, who's meeting with the Ravens today. There's there's some names out there that can definitely be contributors to this room. It's just I don't think any of those guys also prevent you from taking a, an early draft pick. I think that would be like the trade route that would prevent you from taking the early draft pick. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, and they need two. And so, like, yeah, you know, if you, I, I think the ideal situation is. You, you sign one of those guys that you just named and you draft one in the second or third round or something like that. Um, I, I think that's pretty ideal. And I think it's a deep wide receiver class. I think there are guys, you know, down the line that can be impactful, you know. So I think that makes a lot of sense. There is not a guy there that I think you would sign that you would say, oh, we're set a wide receiver. We don't need to draft one. That's uh, that's that's for sure. Uh, not the case. And then, you know, the last of those four corner, I think is very interesting because there's still like a good number of guys out there. I mean, I, I just don't know that they're going to want to 
sign someone a bigger bigger name that is going to like wall off their younger guys um mm-hmm. but there are like i mean Xavier Howard's still out there um Stefan Gilmore's still out there right i mean i think i would look more towards the slot guys avante maddox uh, you know was in philly with uh, andy Weidel, pit guy mm-hmm. uh K1 Williams, not that I'm just picking the pit guys, but <laughs> well, Miles are... Bryant out in New England was the one I was looking at because he played well against the Steelers too, which I feel like is something that like they keep in the back of their mind. Yeah. And so um and, and look, they still have their guys too, right? They can bring Shannon Sullivan back, they can bring Pat Pete back. And, and I think you know, those are starting to feel like good options for them. Uh, if they really want that slot guy, but there are a lot of cornerbacks out there that are pretty good. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. think this is a position where, you know, they're they're feeling the, the sort of pressure that I think exists at center and maybe to a lesser extent wide receiver where there just aren't that many guys. There's a lot of corners out there. And I think if they really want one uh, before the draft, especially in the slot, they'll find one. Um, be remiss. We didn't talk about Cam Sutton now, I guess. He's uh, technically yeah. on this list. I don't think anyone will be hmm. signing him anytime soon until his legal issues uh, cleared up. He was cut by the Lions today. Apparently still on the run from police in Florida. Wanted man now for multiple yeah. weeks uh, after a felony domestic violence charge. You know, you hate to see this kind of thing. And it's um, it, it's really a, a, a powerful reminder that you don't really know these people. I talked to Cam Sutton a lot over the years. Always seemed like a, a thoughtful and, and caring guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, was very surprised to hear that. Certainly, uh, hoping that uh, you know he does the right thing and and uh, takes responsibility for his actions and uh, eventually gets uh, some help and and is able to uh, move uh, learn from his mistakes and 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 I hope his uh, significant others are right. But you know, I, I think this is uh, this is tough because and this is why you know when we talk about why are Omar Khan and Mike Tomlin flying around the country. Uh, scouting guys at pro days. This is why you got to try to get to know these people as well as you can, because the Lions sure. just paid him $33 million a year ago, and now they don't have a starting core. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that well said, I mean, not football related at all, but obviously wishing the best to the significant other and, and hopefully I don't want to see anything bad come of it. Like the fact that he has not been found yet is still on the run is also a kind of scary element to this. Like you hope he doesn't do anything stupid while in the process of this but hope that he does turn himself in and everything you know works out the way best possible at this point so um but yeah uh we got a whole bunch of questions coming in let's let's like kind of hit them like rapid fire you just want to trade them there's a whole pile here coming in yeah yeah yeah. uh the first one that shows up for me don't know if it's first one shows up for you we've talked a lot about the trade we've made the case for and against Cruz Steels, he says, if we had to pick one, Terry McLaurin versus Brandon IU, trade package, value, and fit, everything into consideration. Uh, I mean, I don't, I mean, it was sort of reported that Terry McLaurin's not available, so it's kind of call, hard, call to, tell you, how, how, hard <laughs> to tell you what the trade package would need to be to get him, right? I mean, I, I don't mm-hmm. know. I think that's that's probably impossible to answer. Um how about this one from Mikey G735, a longtime and dedicated listener? It's too simple to say the draft capital it would re- it would more likely take to acquire Brandon Ayuk means that it's another season of Dan Moore starting for sure. He said it would probably still do it even if so, but basically does trading for Brandon Ayuk mean that the Steelers would not mm. have the draft capital to upgrade Dan Moore at tackle? Thoughts? I mean – yeah, yes, in short, because if you're if you're trading that first round pick, and then even if it is a tackle that you take in the second round, and then and man, I don't really I really don't know what they're doing at like center and but okay, say they sign like a say they say sign Brian Allen, they trade their first round pick for Ayuk, um, so they don't have the first round pick, and then you're taking the tackle in the second round. I mean, I would think at least you know half the season, like you're gonna see Dan Moore, if not the entire season, like say you get Patrick Paul out of Houston or uh, Kingsley Samati or whatever out of BYU. Uh, there's the the tackle Kieran out of Yale. There's there's some developmental tackle prospects that are out there on day two, but none of them that are going to start over Dan Moore, you know, out, out the gate. So yes, in short. We got next. Um, 
what has the greater chance of happening? Patrick Peterson returns to the Steelers on a one-year deal or Le'Veon Bell returns as RB3? Very clearly, very easily, Patrick Peterson returning. I think I think um, I may have a better chance. Well, in a minute, I'm me. <laughs> but, like, Lev Bell is not coming back. Right. Who's your if, ideal QB3 for the Steelers? Sam T- Tessier uh, with both of these. Uh, mine was Josh Dobbs, but that's off the table now. I think the QB3 yeah. is a draft. I mean, I think we've we've talked about that. I expect them to draft one. Jordan Travis, Spencer Rattler, flip a coin. I think one of those two guys probably feels pretty close to ideal. If they can get him in the you know fourth or fifth. Or yeah, six. I will say I had thought about the Josh Dobbs thing. Like if because yeah, we've seen that need three guys to play. If they were gonna go that route, I don't know, maybe like a Kyle Allen or something like that that's still out there. I don't know. Um like if they're just gonna sign a quarterback, yeah. I mean there's guys yeah. out there. I don't know that there's anybody that like really moves me. Um, right. But if they were saying, you know, uh, Jordan Travis, but like obviously where the medicals and stuff are, they just want to stash him on the practice squad for a year or whatever. They still need a QB three that could play if he had to, that isn't Jordan Travis. Yeah. yeah there's not, like that's what I was there's not like a whole bunch of those guys out there. So I don't, I don't know. How funny would it be if Ryan Tannehill was QB three? Like everybody that we mentioned this off season to pair with Kenny Pickett just all came together. Got them all. To replace they got him. them all. They got them all. <laughs> um, uh, Ryan here says, "Will we address center anytime soon, or is this we have to take a center in round one pigeonhole?" Would seem unwise if so, but I certainly trust the con artist. I still think they're going to make a move. I mean, they brought Mitch Morse in on that free agent visit. That is them telling us they want to sign a center in free agency. I just don't know what they're waiting for. Yeah. I guess Brian Allen, maybe keep your fingers crossed. I don't know. Uh, would you think a pa- a package of next year's first, this year's third, and Liao would be enough to pull away Brandon <laughs> I uh, I mean, what does Liao add to that trade? I mean, you might as well just said the first and third. Good. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess. No. I- I mentioned to you, could they get away with it being with a second this year or something, and then like the first next year? Uh, I wasn't really thinking about Liao, and I don't think that they would go for as little as a third this year in return. Because you got to imagine the the trade chart basically says, and you brought this up yesterday, I believe as well. But like a first round next year is the equivalent of a second round this year, or a first round pick in two years is the equivalent of a third round this year. Um, so if you're talking about first next year that's basically a second i don't think that a second a third and demarvin leal is getting you brandon Ayuk. it's certainly not anywhere near what the current ask will be like i, I think yeah. you would honestly need to like get into the draft this year and he's still not traded before they got to that sort of panic. which apparently is I, I don't know if you want to believe this there's a report put out there today that san francisco will like entertain offers through the first round of the draft i don't know if that is to be believed but We'll see if that happens, if they hold on to him that long. And if that's the case, are they going to be like, is that them saying we're, we are trading him? This is when like the deadline to do so is. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think they should probably go up until the draft, though, because there will be teams that want a wide receiver that don't get one. Right. I mean, I think that's like like mm, your, yeah. your balance thing. Right. Like, do I trade for Brandon Ayuk or do I draft a, a wide receiver early? And it's like, OK, if you're if you're uh, let's say you're Arizona. Right. And you're sitting there with that high pick and some team just blows you away. Somebody wants to trade like three firsts to come up and get uh, their quarterback. Uh, well, I mean, Arizona really wants a wide receiver, but maybe, you know, uh, that 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 team that comes way up is the Raiders who are picking down the teens. And then when they get there, all the top receivers are off the board. Well, then, OK, then at that point, like I think Arizona would go. I mean, I don't know if they want to trade him uh, you know, t- to a divisional <laughs> team, but I think Arizona yeah. would then go way to the top of the list in terms of uh, a, a team that would be really looking to trade for Brandon Ayuk and would also have the draft capital. Didn't now Arizona could could get their two firsts for uh, get their three firsts in that trade and turn around and spin a, you know, a next year's first and a second for Ayuk and at that point maybe make it worthwhile. I think that's yeah, they absolutely have to consider it all the way through the draft. Next up here I've got uh do you f- find it odd they haven't announced what number Justin Fields will wear? Love the show, by the way. Let's never do that. That's from Mr. Hammer. Uh, 
No, I, 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 I don't know. I have no. It, well, it, well, it's probably not going to be one, right? I mean, that's the number that he's worn going back to Ohio State. No one's worn it since 1999. Um, so I can't see that changing. I don't know. They've never really like given a reason why they don't give out number one. I, I don't never really understood that. So, so I googled it and it said something about like it became the Chiefs number following the last player to wear it. It, it was a quarterback, uh, Anthony something. Anthony Wright, I believe was. His yes. Name. Yep. 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 Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know. I whatever. Eleven would be fine, I guess. Uh, our it's top available. 30 visits a good indicator of interest level. Seeing Zach Frazier as the first one makes me think they're either trading up in the second round or have a round one grade on him. Yes, top 30 visits are a good I- indicator of interest level, especially for guys where Mike and Omar are not going to go to their pro day. I wrote about this extensively today about how the pro day thing is changing and that you're not going to – this streak of them going to their first round picks pro day every year is going to end sooner than later. Uh, because the, the way Pro Day's work is changing, the schedule's been condensed, it's impossible to get to very many of them, and they have all these other opportunities. They're going to bring these guys in for visits. They see them at the combine, they see them at the Senior Bowl, and I think the Steelers are pretty confident that they can do what they need to do at the Senior Bowl and the combine and bring a guy in a visit and not need to necessarily need to see them at a Pro Day. So I don't know if Mike and Omar are going to the Big 12 Pro Day in, in Dallas um, mm-hmm. at the end of next week, but if they are, they aren't. Keep Zach Frazier on the board. They like him. They have liked him. It's not a secret. They're very, very transparent about the players they like. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have much to add to that other than just the fact that we. Sh- I guess we could bring up the fact that uh, three visits today for top 30s. Fuaga, uh, Xavier Leggett, who was a wide receiver that we brought up in the past. And this one's really interesting. Georgia State offensive lineman Travis Glover. Anything on him that you've watched or heard of? That Big. Big. Uh, he came in late in the Senior Bowl week. They like showed up midweek as a re- injury replacement. Did okay, I thought, mm. considering the um, and, and just seems like have prototypical size. Like I, probably pretty raw. Um, you know, not sure. Like Georgia State has has run in the past some weird offenses uh, where like I don't know if it's going to be an easy transition for him. But I mean, certainly seems like a guy that they have some serious interest in. Yes, like a top thirty visit definitely means. Oh, we're interested in this guy. You're flying him to Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, you're 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 not doing that for someone that you you don't really care that much about. And uh, this one wasn't from Max, but you said our boy uh, Thomas Brocious, the uh, the all knowing ball knower, the knower of ballage uh, from YouTube, had something on Calvin Austin and kind of like his fit within the offense. Yeah, it's not great, right? I mean, he doesn't block, and not that like he's not willing. He's just very small. Um, mm-hmm. And they don't really use slot receivers that much. I'm really curious to see what they do with Calvin Austin. I think Arthur Smith is creative enough to come up with ways to scheme him into the offense, but it's not this obvious fit from the outside where it seems like, you know, oh, there's this great role built for him. I've thought for a while now that I think the fan base is a lot higher on Calvin Austin than the team is. I really like him. He's a great guy, Uh, you know, obviously unbelievably fast. I think he has a lot to learn about, uh, you know, the receiver position, how to run routes, and how to get open for his size. I think that's a very difficult thing for a lot of guys that it takes a long time for them to learn. Even Tyreek Hill wasn't necessarily great yeah. uh, as a rookie and a young player. I know, there's obviously the transition from college to the pros, but like being at the Senior Bowl the year that Cal was coming out and watching him just like the short area spacing, like when they would get into the red zone and him just making guys look stupid with his short area burst on his routes. I was like, man, this guy just isn't like a straight speed track star. Like he can actually do some different things for you. Uh, granted, you know, you're talking about now transitioning to the NFL. Of course, he missed his entire rookie year due to a foot injury, which set him back. But yeah, I I, I don't know what to make of him. The, the one comp that I keep thinking of uh, just because of this is another Arthur Smith guy, like could he maybe have a Khalif Raymond type role like he had in Tennessee, you know, but he was uh, he, had, he was a little bit more thick, like he was like 180 at least Cal's down in like the 160s. So there's obviously a weight difference there. But again, a smaller player, he's only five, eight Cal's at least listed as five, nine. Don't know how true that is. But um, yeah, that's that's maybe the role that he could carve out for himself within this offense. Yeah, uh, Austin at the. Uh combine was five seven and six eights 
something. Okay. Five eight generously is uh yeah, they got him listed as five nine one sixty nine right now. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm not buying that one. <laughs> so um but yeah, I think that's it, Alan, unless you got anything else. Back it's up to five and oh. So Tar Heels. Yeah. Well, who uh, what other game went final? Oh, you North Carolina to... Wagner. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I'm not, I then. not necessarily dancing over the uh, <laughs> one seed. The one seed pick is not. Uh, hey, it's, you still got to get it though. It's the, you still got to get the result at the end of the day. So. Illinois holding tough against Moorhead State. That one. Uh, that one could yeah. be dangerous. That one's in Omaha mm-hmm. there after the Dukes got their upset win. Still, uh, still early, but I see a six eleven here with the 11 leading Oregon over South Carolina. Who who do you have in that one? I believe I have Oregon. Okay. All right. I'd actually have to check on that one on my bracket. But either way, uh, Alan, tell the people they can find you. At Other Sunders, than sweating out your brackets. Yeah, at A Saunders underscore PGH, PGH Steelers now. SteelersNow.com. You can find me watching basketball for the next 72 hours pretty much straight. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Getting ready to go to the owners' meetings late next week. You know, I, I should have thought about. It. We should have done a bracket challenge with the audience. Like I think of all these things after the fact. We're going to be doing the show next year, though, as well. Unless you know, Alan decides, wises up and kicks me to the curb or something, finds a better co-host. So we'll definitely be sure to do it for year two, season two of the afternoon drive. But uh, yeah, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, hit us in the comments with thoughts, questions, who you guys have winning the NCAA tournament. We want to know on that as well. Uh, leave us a five star review if you're listening somewhere else, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from. You can find me everywhere at Zachary Smith PGH, Alan Saunders, and myself. Thanks for jumping in, take another ride on the Steelers afternoon drive. Hey.